This is the strategy inside everything. I'm Adam Pierno. All right, welcome back to another episode of the Strategy Inside Everything. Uh, excited to have this talk. We've been working on this one for a while, but today's guest is always out and about. I couldn't, I couldn't get him in front of a microphone for quite a while. He's a busy guy. Um, today, I have the founder and creative director at Pallet Group and co-founder of Allyship and Action, Mr. Nate Nichols. Nate, how you doing? What's up? I'm Gucci, man. I'm feeling really good. I'm feeling balanced. I'm feeling aligned. I'm feeling like 2020 is making a semblance, some semblance of sense right now. Got my it's- vax appointment. I'm feeling good. Oh yeah, I got I got my vaccine uh, last uh, early this month. I got my final one, so yeah, it's oh, a, it's man. it's quite a feeling. You feel oh, ten pounds man. lighter immediately. Yeah, man, you're a bad bitch right now. <laughs> <laughs> enjoy, you'll enjoy it. You'll notice, like, oh, I feel oh, like man. a little bit, a little bit. The yeah. world just got a little better. Man, can't do you, wait. <laughs> do you feel like 2021 when the calendar turned? Did you feel like that meant anything? Not at all. Not at all. Like. I, when you, when you exist in trauma, like your life experiences trauma, you know how it works. You know that, you know, trauma doesn't like just go away because a year lapses. It is somewhere. It's like under your bed, in your closet, like I know. in your refrigerator, like behind the eggs, like it's creeping. There's some residual effects that we're going to be feeling from 2020 for a while. So uh, totally to, to think that it just goes away with, you know, some system that humans made to uh rationalize a day and time nah man that ain't it i agree i I was i was looking forward to new year and then i realized like what's nothing is changing it's just psychological and it didn't it it wasn't a big enough psychological change to mean much to me no still living it but the the vax the vaccine is a bigger you'll see the psychological shift that's I, yeah, it's just great. Like I said, that with friends who are vaccinated, and I feel I feel more comfortable. And you know, my mom got vaccinated. My uncle who had COVID. He's a bit stubborn, and he's trying to figure out. Or we're, we're trying to figure out how to make him feel more comfortable about the idea. Uh, and you know, I think there's just there's just some sort of peace in it. You know, yeah. and I think we all sort of deserve whatever that peace looks like. We earned it. Yep. We've earned we've earned it for sure. Um, I did not bring you on to talk about the pandemic, but uh, I don't think it, it's impossible to have a conversation today without talking about it. So um, I brought you on to talk about creative direction, leadership. Um, we had a chance to small talk a little before we got going here. And can you can you talk about so Palette Group is not a s- typical ad agency. I don't even know if I would call it an ad agency. I don't think I would. Do you want to talk about? I think before sure. let's describe Palette Group. And then I want to talk about how you started Pallet Group. Perfect. So the way we position and describe Pallet Group is a creative agency in a production house. And, you know, my life partner was also my business partner. We spell house the German way because she's German. Uh, and when I say German, I mean, just like some white person in America was like, I'm half German, half Irish, she was <laughs> German, German, like she's German, German. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, for both of us, we sort of live a very self-expressed life um, and motivated by freedom um, and not by achievements or accolades or industries. It's it's more like where can we be our whole selves um, and provide a platform for people to be their whole selves. And so the creative agency and business model really, really stuck out to me. Um, and then the production company uh, business model really, really stuck out to me. And there's there's this opportunity um, to sort of, met, you know, gel the both of them. And yeah. clients already come to us for these things already and they have been. So they would come to us for creative strategy uh, for their social channels and then say, well, obviously we talk to you about creative strategy. Can you also produce the content? And so there was already this inherent of the two worlds, um, but sort of being more intentional about the designing the business model to function um, in silos, but also in a way that uh, there was uh, some synchronicity and more clear overlap with sort of the vision. And uh, that's sort of how we operate, like a creative strategy and execution um, shop. So come to us for creative concepts, but also execution against those concepts um, and bringing those life from digital formats, uh, video formats, all different types of media and uh, experiential activation. Stephanie's body of work is huge in the experiential space. He started a career at BMW 
nice. building out retail design experiences across the, the nation in America here. Um, piloted the program, in fact. And, you know, from there, it's just, okay, cool, let's produce and make the content and pull together, staffing a crew, getting the right director, getting the right producers um, in place, no matter where they are in the world, to make it happen. What were the what were the first couple of projects that got you that when you decided to do this? Were they were they video projects? Were they TV commercials? Or what kind of projects did you start with? That's a great and funny question. So when I graduated college, I actually got a, a degree in graphic design from the R Institute of Philadelphia. Yep. Like nothing prestigious. I didn't learn anything about the advertising world. I had no idea how the industry functioned and like different categories, levels, and I was sort of just running around and running amok in Philadelphia, just being a, a whole entrepreneur, just scaling myself as a freelancer. And then when I graduated college, I actually wound up on this huge, huge multi-million dollar campaign. Uh, it's like a five million dollar campaign uh, rolling out the Hyundai Veloster in 2012. And it was through InOcean. Uh, oh, yeah. InOcean was the AOR at the time. I think they still may be through uh, David and Goliath. And then I was... Uh, they subbed out the social work to um, the agency at um, Heart Hanks in the suburbs okay. of PA. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I sat across a woman named Elle, and I'll never forget Elle. She just like listened to me talk my shit for like, you know, how I freelanced my entire career and leveraged social media to get all of my clients. Like my body of work in our school is like 300 clients by the time I graduated. Like I just, social media was like my thing. Yeah. Um, in 2011 and 10. And it's a 12. And so she was like, hell yeah, let's bring this, you know, this kid on, even though he doesn't have experience in social media. I am not managing, you know, Hyundai social media presence for like five months on this campaign. And they flew me around to like Vegas, Miami, LA to be at these parties and these activations, Chelsea Market. And, you know, it was just, I was in utter awe at like the level of production value of culture that was injected into this campaign. Like ASAP Rocky was in some of the videos talking about the rims and they had leveraged just different aspects of culture and pop culture in a way that, you know, obviously I knew was a were thing, you, but I never Nate, really been inside of it. Were you organizing all that? No, you were a kid who was along, basically you were managing the social aspect of it. So you were yep. taking the work that was different partners were doing and you were figuring out how to connect it all and get it correct communicated in the best way through social correct oh yeah. that's that's so interesting I was, yeah i was just going through social and helping with like community management strategy mostly but once i got on that i was like oh i understand the entire ecosystem yeah and like this is the game that i want to play like because the ecosystem's so vast i was like okay cool i can i can jump in this category and do work and be strategic or I could jump in this category and do work and be strategic. Um, and I really just got fascinated and fell in love. And so from that project, uh, there's a whole new chapter of how Power Group was founded, but that was really the first project that like influenced my career as a creative director and being in the um, ad industry. And, and that vantage point of seeing how the ecosystem connect one piece connects to the other gave you a perspective. Do you think being a community manager in that role was a special place or would it have been, would you have been, had that visibility anywhere else in that, in that campaign? It was special. It was special. I think, I don't know if I, I don't know if I would have had access to uh, a campaign like that in any other way. I think my body of work as a, as a creative and as a strategist then was prime, where I was like prime time was social. My yeah. body of work as a designer wasn't great. Um, it was pretty average. And I was just like, you know, peak entrepreneur, no one could have me strategist, social strategist, and then like designer. And then through time uh, that sort of changed and shifted. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. I, I've, as a, as a art director and designer, I always realize like I'm pretty mediocre at that part. It's just right. part of, it's part of the job I have to do. And I'm not, I'm not really right. great at that. My ideas have to be really good because my, my design is pretty much just boxes that I've moved around on a page. <laughs> so, yeah. but you, but you often don't have the opportunity to like, you're never positioned to be the visionary or shape ideas when you're younger, right? And you don't have experience. So you have to sort of average design your way into like be like better me mediocre design, like just kind of next level. But I was like, fuck that. Like, I don't want to wait for anyone to like validate me as anything. So, you know, I'm just going to figure out the hustle until, you know, I get to where I want to be. So, and it, and it sounds like that, you took that right to pallet group and figured out, yeah. okay, so now that I've, 
now that I've seen this, how can I replicate that? How can I do more of that, get more of that experience being a quarterback or being at the center point of the, of the work versus, you know, waiting for a brief to come to me? Yeah. And I wouldn't call it the center of the work. I'm like actively, actively trying to be anonymous, right? Like I want to get out of the way. I want the platform. And if you think about the idea of a palette, like an artist palette, it is literally a platform for the medium in the color palettes that you choose to put on this canvas. Mm -hmm. And so the original vision is to just be that platform centering the different colors and hues and perspectives that you're going to create with your brush strokes. And so it was very just like intentionally positioned to be like, we are a platform centering creatives. That is the vision long term. And so is it, is it, I know there's a roster of, of kind of known collaborators. Is it that those people are full-time and that's who you work with, or as a project comes, you help build out the network and find, okay, this project is going to feel like this type of thing. Let me find people that have expertise or have done something that's interesting or along those same lines. Totally. It's more of like a bespoke and like artisanal approach to staffing projects. Um, and it's exciting for me because as a creative director, it's my role as a staff, right? Like, that's my function truly is to staff projects, but to know exactly what the client's goals are, the vision are, translate the language, ensure everyone's on the same page uh, with their objectives and their insights and identify the right creatives to like, just get after it. And a lot of the times, obviously you have an ECD or ACD, like sort of stuck and glued to their partner and that, and their, the team yeah. that they hire, but they, the, the disadvantage to that structure, that traditional advertising model is that that's the team. The team is the team. You know, if there's a brand that comes to them and they look at them, they're like, I don't know if they have the lived experience to really understand my consumer. I can give them insights all day. I can give them these trend reports all day. You know, I don't know if the honesty and the truth of how the outcome's going to be is really going to be there. And you see that, you see that now, you see yeah. that with, you know, the BK tweet, like, we're just doing the systems aren't malleable enough to meet the the brand's needs. And so for us, we have a huge network based on the community building that I've done in my life, based mm -hmm. on the community building that Steffi's done in her life, and based on the stuff that we've done together. Um, a big, big case study is the Freelancer Cyber Summit last year. That was the first virtual summit we did. Allyship in Action was our second. So we launched a digital platform for the freelance community around COVID and supporting them. Like most of the work that we do is inclusive to support communities. And the first community we want to support was freelancers. And so we have like a thousand freelancers that came to our, our virtual summit to learn how to navigate the industry from their position as freelancers right. by connecting them with, you know, the David, um, the, the grinders of the world and, you know, the, uh, the, the directors of like Virtue, um, Crystal Walt, uh, Wattler came through and talked to them and like the head of uh, creative production at Foot Locker like connected with them. And then no, you're Griner, you're talking about David Griner from Adweek, right? Correct. Yeah, 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 yeah. Griner from Adweek. And so, you know, how do we bridge the gap and ensure that community is supported? And so for us, we actually had a huge, huge network, almost like to the likes of like We Are Rosie, even though we're not going in that business model direction, that we could tap to support um, projects. And so that's sort of how our approach is truly designing, um, you know, a campaign around uh, the, the lived experience, the consumer that uh, our, our clients are advertising to in the project's creative needs. So we have the ability to like truly pick through the different um, types of people that we work with and collaborators from around the globe to staff appropriately. You, you gave me so many things to dig into. So I'm going to try to stay focused on creative direction, right. um, but sorry, no, sorry. don't apologize at all. Um, you mentioned that creative directors often in, at an agency model have an established team. They have their like go-to people. It's usually go-to guys more often than not. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think, You've, you've not been a creative director in a, an agency, but how do you think being a creative director over an ever-changing group of teams and, and coworkers is different than that creative directing, that kind of known set of staff? I think there's, a, there's, there's this huge privilege of being with the creatives in their day-to-day um, their -day as their projects 
they as they work on their own projects as freelancers. You know, to give you an example, I was talking to my homie Chris Cryan yesterday, who's a who's a CD and he's on a project with a big company right now, and he's he's just sharing how his experience with them is like it's great to be designing this for this Fortune 100 company. I've done this before, but you know, I can't. I'm doing the same thing I was doing for them years ago, where um they're like be creative. And then slowly just chipping away at like how creative he can actually be. Yeah. And you know, and I'm receiving that and I'm like, oh word. So I, I know what you want, you know? Like I'm able to receive these creators in a way that I understand what they want versus serving them things that they have to do because yeah. of their salary is on the line. Right. You know, or the, this this is something where, you know, I talk to someone like my homie Ani Akopian, you know, and she's like, I just had this challenge with this, you know, pitch. And I'm like, I hate that I have to like put together these pitch decks for these briefs. And it's so stupid that I have to be a part of this bid process. And I'm like, I agree because as a bespoke, like a, a boutique agency, I don't want to be pitching either. I'd rather someone know what they want, know that we can handle it. Right. We take it in and we distribute accordingly. And that's yeah. just our, our business. Now we've been very privileged enough to be able to get businesses. People know what, what they want from us. We don't need a bid. And it is what it is. And yeah. we just move forward. And so there's just so much beauty in allowing, creating a space for people to work that accommodates them and their desires versus having a huge traditional clunky structure that people are just doing the work because they have to. There's no really true burning designer, burning desire to like do the work inside of these big uh, traditional agency models. Yeah, where you have to, I've, I've lived it, and you have to find the morale boosting project. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Uh, I've been <laughs> killing these guys with small space bank ads for two months. Now I got to go find something <laughs> quote unquote yeah. creative for them to do. So what you're yeah. doing, I would always look for things that would be like, okay, oh, I know this person wants, would love to do something that uses type. So let me just try to find right. an assignment. I keep that bookmarked. But for the way Palette Group is built, the assignment comes in and you say, let me think, let me look at the network. Who have I talked to recently? And what do I know that they are working on or thinking about? And this yeah. will be, oh, this is right up their alley. So they come to you like psyched. They're ready to go. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And so does that make the creative direction easier? Or in some ways, if someone is, you know, running a hundred million miles on a direction and you say, oh, I think this project lines up with that. Does it make it harder to rein them in or to say, okay, now do it for this in line with this brand or this, this company's goals? Does it make it harder it in some it, ways? It makes it just so much more um, fun and easier. Like it, I wouldn't say hard or easy because, you know, production is a production. They're always going to be terribly hard. And like yeah, yes. client interfacing, client satisfaction is always going to be a challenge. It's always going to be more feedback rounds and revisions than originally scoped in. Like that's always hard, but the beauty, the fulfillment is always higher. You know, like there's always a project on the other end that people feel more fulfilled in. And like, there's this ROI on fulfillment that people can now get to live in and be with. And they're something that actually positioned their body of work further in the work that they want to do versus something they may or may not show to someone because they're like, eh, eh, I'm not proud of this. It's like, all around, we're all proud of the work in a, in a way that, you know, we don't have to, you know, be inauthentic and, and sharing it with people. It's like, we did this thing that we're all excited about and the energy stays high and it's, um, it's funner, I would say, not like easier. Um, it's definitely funner. It sounds like it's fun. more, more energized. Totally. Totally. And that's my thing. Like, we just won't take products unless we're energized by them. And I don't want clients to work with us unless we're energized and we're in this together. Like period. Like if we're not mutually energized, like, and we're not sustaining that energized, you know, uh, momentum, like there's a mutual termination clause in all of my contracts. Like let's just all go our separate ways. Cause we had thought this was a good thing and maybe it wasn't. And so, um, yeah, we just kind of, you know, we, we, we lived for energized experiences. I feel honest. I feel true. Um, I feel fulfilling. Yeah. I do that too. At each phase, there's a mutual termination where it's like, I'm going to finish what I committed to, but then let's, let's take a look and see if this is still doing what we want to do. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I agree if it gets stale on a, on a project, what are we doing? It's not, mm -hmm. we don't have a, we don't have a five-year contract. What are we doing? If it's just a, no. uh, let's make it fun and make it fulfilling for everybody. Right. 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 
How do you yeah. think not coming up through an agency has maybe benefited? Maybe I won't say benefited. How do you think that's shaped what Palette Group is? Because even your analogy of the palette itself as the platform for the medium, it's just a lot different than what I hear from, from agency creative directors. How, how do you think that looking at it from the outside or looking at it from another direction has, has shaped what you're building? It has shaped my community a lot further. I feel like the system has been dominated by white dudes for forever. And, you know, I can't imagine the the network I have right now if I didn't do the boutique and start my own shop route. Like, I can't speak to the experience of being in a traditional agency. I can only speak to what I've heard in you know, that experience. And so I'm going to just speak to my lived experience where, of course. you know, in Philly, we had our studio, you know, it was in Kensington, which is like east, west of um, uh, Fishtown, which is like the Williamsburg. I don't know if you're a New Yorker, but basically it's like a, the cool hip neighborhood. But yeah. then like, you know, it, it's the next gentrifying neighborhood. And that's where our studio was in Kensington, <laughs> Philly. And so it was a bit like Scudder, you know, and we had the most beautiful space on that side of Philadelphia, like the architecture of our space was actually a senior thesis project for, you know, a bunch of architects at Temple. And so it was a beautiful space. So That's I cool. would do these things called speakeasy hours. And this is how we build our community of creatives in Philly, um, where I invite like some dude I met that, you know, as a real estate developer and about to open like a social club. And then I'd uh, invite like a, a fashion designer and then the team would invite all all of their homies and friends and so we'd be having like fried chicken from a, a food truck guy who was like i want to be like hanging around the space too yeah more people Dude, wanted more people chicken. wanted in <laughs> yeah. yeah so we create this like we create this like studios uh, uh 54 sort of atmosphere and vibe at our studio where like once a month randomly it's like speakeasy hour and you can invite to the studio and just hang out and people would just build and connect and it was just wonderful and serendipitous and I just don't know that amount of like creative harmony and harmony around community um, can be as intentional in uh, the traditional model uh, because of ego, because of territory, because of, you know, I have to protect mine because I have to get to the next level, you know? Yeah. You know, I have to get to this award accolade because it's so important. And, you know, when you don't grow up in the agency system, you don't know. You're just doing stuff to do stuff. You're not following the same rules. Right. Only now am I like, oh, wow, because I'm in this privileged position to be judging award shows. I'm like, oh, all these projects. Yeah, are now, I, now I see how it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. I just need to create a budget for these things. That's why I'm failing. I don't have a budget for ads annually yeah. or excuse me, for campaigns annually. And so. You know, it's <laughs> it's just these silly things that you're like, this this is why people aren't allowed in, you know, or they're boxed out of this role. Like, no one would hire me because of my body of work, even though I could probably out hustle and not be creative than any other person. Yeah, I didn't have enough seasoned experience, and so since I don't have enough seasoned experience, I'm not like as applicable in the journey of getting to that Webby or getting to that lion, right? Than some white dude over there who's worked at McCann. And so it's, there's, there are all these systems and like nuance and bureaucracy and just bullshit that we don't have to deal with. Yeah. Um, Are you, it's funny coming up, I came up through kind of big agencies and then now I do judge award shows every now and then. And you do see the, you can tell right away when you start judging and you start going through the entries like, Oh, okay. This agency has a budget and a plan. Like this is how they're going to attack this show. And I could see, you know, if it's a regional Addies or something, I'm like, Oh, this agency is like that. I got it. Mm-hmm. This agency really believes in this one campaign that they did. It's the only thing they entered. You could kind of, you could kind of feel that. Um, and sure. the creatives that experience that on either side of that, it shapes their reputation and yeah. gets them the next thing. Like if you work at an agency that has that budget, mm-hmm. you become that person that was won all those awards. And if you didn't, yes. you could have a exactly. killer book and nobody knows who the hell you are. Exactly. It's, exactly. It's crazy. Are, is that shaping, is that exposure shaping your interest in award shows? Or are you just like, I don't I still not, still not interested. A thousand percent. You know, there are, there just aren't enough people who look like me winning awards and it's frustrating and it hurts. You yeah. know, it actually, it makes me so angry that like, you have like 
Jayanta Jenkins and the, and, the, and the Saturday morning crew, you know, killing them, knocking them dead. But, you know, what about the team of Epiphanies? You know, it, it, Coltrane Curtis is like, he deserves his, his joints as well. And like, it just, you know, the We Are Translations are finally getting up there, you know, the Chaucer and the Steve Stouts. But why is it taking this long? Like, it's sort of frustrating. And, and I don't know, I just, there needs to be more people that look like us. And so, I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm like on a you know a bender right now. To be like, no, we're gonna we're gonna get we're gonna get those pencils. We're gonna get those lines, and it's gonna be the most beautiful you know arrangement of culture, ethnicity, of women you know that yeah. are gonna be leading these projects and that are staffing these projects and getting those awards. And so that's where we're at about it right now. I'm just like I'm tired of the same people. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of these white dudes <laughs> just like snatching up these awards. I know. Like I they just... own the place. If they did a picture, an annual picture of the top award winners every year, it's like the same. It's like, a, I guess it would look like a fraternity pick composite. Like the, yeah. <laughs> every, every four years, a couple of new people show up, but it's pretty much the same. It's pretty much the same mm-hmm. picture. Mm-hmm. So you've been essentially, you built Palette Group building off of this idea of community. You yep. put together the Freelancer Expo as a, the same idea as an expansion of that and building into community. Uh, I used to think of ad agencies as communities. What what I found excited about working at agencies was that it was all like really smart, creative people working together. But over time, you realize that the the processes and the structure and the, I guess, the money of it, the corporate need of it really tilts that community. Mm -hmm. How are you keep, how do you keep that organic and keep the community loose is there anything anything you're doing consciously or is it just how it's working out that you're able to keep it community focused and and keep the business part of it friend friendly enough i guess or loose enough that it's that it doesn't constrict the shape of the the community good question i think there was a time where we were staff we have a full-time team of like 10 people back in philly and now we're like three so literally it's just three of us uh full-time running right oh that's interesting so there was there's a point where like yeah we had like the account team the strategists the creative uh, strategists you know a cd art directors and two photographers on staff and you know it quickly i learned that the bureaucracy of um even just the internal culture of you know someone's a creative strategist now like i think i'm a creative director like i don't need a creative strategist anymore like let's figure out how to do that i'm like sure and then having an art director who's like, I also am like totally qualified to be a creative director, right. you know, and then a photographer is like, I also think I want to be an art director. And you're like, Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Your full-time <laughs> job is managing, <laughs> is managing egos. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, I quickly learned that I'm like, Oh wow. I don't think that I want to build a structure like this ever again. Yeah. Um, you know, not that it's ever again, I, I learned that I had to take a pause on designing team because I wanted to expand my community further to, you know, really, really be intentional about who we, you know, if such when we do start staffing full time, um, who we pull in uh, to just get a sense about how other creatives operate in, in the spaces that we need them to. And so I think 2020 really allowed us to see that you could manage a structure like this remotely. Like every, most agencies operated and functioned remotely. So, you know, do we yeah. actually need full time? I don't know. Like, and do we need to come into the same space every day? I don't know. And I think there's a piece of that in what you're, you, you asked me. And then I also think what's informing our decision to like stay sort of small and bespoke and intentional is this idea that, you know, we want people to feel self-fulfilled and not dependent on us. Yes. We want creatives to feel like they have their own, you know, laying in their own body of work and we're helping to shape their career. Like we are a platinum for them in their career. Um, and that's sort of how, you know, anyone who's ever moved through Palette Group has experienced us too. It's like I had uh, someone working full-time for us in 2019. Um, and this gentleman was a, a, a black man who moved from Boston to the city and he had just a crazy professional experience where he's like working directly with Harvey Weinstein during the debacle. Oh my God. And 
he went to film school, but he's still like crazy, crazy background. And I had met him when I started to rev up the production side of the business. And he just was like, whatever, I just want to learn how to be like a black man in America who can stand on my own two feet. He had no idea what he wanted to be in his group when he grew up. And so I was like, sure, like we can rock together, but like, you know, let's just like recognize that like wherever you want to go, I'm supporting you. Um, but like, I don't, I'm not in the position yet to like get right. to the next level, right? And he understood that very clearly. And now he's in Oakland. He has his own agency now. And he's killing it. Like he's he's like right there in Oakland, like who's racking up the clients and he's not stressed anymore. You know, him and his girlfriend are like living a beautiful, fulfilled life. And he still produces with us when we have projects. He's on campaigns right now with us. And it's just a beautiful sort of uh again, har like it's just a harmony, harmony based like experience. You yeah. Know, it's very, very, very um organic and not um nothing's forced in our relationship as a creator. it's more like uh, yeah what you're describing is more like instead of a business relationship it's structured more like a friendship in that not that like oh we'll just be friends and forgive everything that goes wrong but that there's a door mm -hmm. and here they people you tell people this is what's inside the door if you want to work with us right. and they choose right. to come in and out and when they have right. a, a project or something that works it it works right. versus that that yeah, relationship right. that causes that tension of like well i think right. i should be this or that and, and at the end of the day, entrepreneurship is about developing and designing systems. It's not about people. It's about systems. If the systems are right, it doesn't matter who you put in the position, they should still be able to thrive, right? And so for us, it's we get an art director on a project, we staff them, they get all of our systems and they're just off to the races. Like we yeah. can get a brief on a Monday, brief our art director on a Tuesday, Wednesday, they're just after it. They're gone. Systems are already set in place, you know, yeah. and that's what entrepreneurship's about. It's it's about systems and processes, not people. Yeah. You so you just segued right into allyship and action for me because you talked <laughs> yeah. about you talked about community, but then you also talked about systems and processes. Um, you built a community for Palk Group. You built the Freelance Expo. And then in the summer of 2020, America's going crazy. There's all mm -hmm. sites of activity. Uh, you know, the trial of uh, Derek Chauvin's going Chauvin, on now. Yeah. Um, and I started to notice, I had already noticed your work with Palak Group, but I started to notice what you were doing with Allyship in Action. Talk for people who don't know what it is. Talk mm -hmm. about what, what you're doing there, please. So Allyship in Action was a, a opportunity to challenge the advertising industry. Uh, to really recognize the work that needs to be done around accountability and transparency of, you know, their systems and how, you know, inherently there are just these blocks uh, around uh, people of color, black people, uh, women, disabled communities. And, you know, just through my lived experience, I've, I faced it, you know, like people look at my body of work and be like, whoa, your website's so cool. I put a product so cool. And it's like, yeah. And you're like, but you you don't know the shit I had to go through to get here. Like, I'm still over 100k in college debt that I'll never be able to pay off because of the interest rates, because of systemic issues in our government that like still burden me. Yeah. Right. Like that is my lived experience through advertising. So I'm not only trying to shape my career off my body of work, but it's my lived experience on top of that based on systemic racism and, and oppression to marginalized communities that exist beyond it. And so it's really just shaking the industry to realize that you're not just, you're not just here to pluck a bunch of black people, you know, out of a crowd to like meet a quota. Yeah. You're, 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 you should be designing a workforce for people to feel safe and feel like they're actually going to be able to navigate this world professionally safely, but also that their professional life is going to actually have an effect on their lived experience outside of work. Like, will they be able to take on um, and, and pay off their college tuition and make sure their families are okay and make sure they have the right health care, et cetera, et cetera, because there are so many more issues that we have to deal with as marginalized people in this country than, you know, the average white dude. And so really just being very transparent about the lived experience beyond the professional experience of people um, that are marginalized in our industry. And so we just designed this like very dynamic and like real and humanizing conversation for our industry to have. 
Yeah. And it was, it was necessary. You've talked about lived experience a few times and you just referenced professional experience. And I want to get your take on how professional experience affects lived experience, like how, how one affects the other, because a lot of the systems and processes before someone gets through high school, gets through their education, even are designed or have just been shaped to put those marginalized communities in a disadvantaged position Mm -hmm. for someone who navigated their way through college. You had, you got through uh, the art Institute, you started the professional journey. What does the professional experience do to inform that lived experience? Like how, how can that be improved? I know you're talking to agencies and people uh, in relationship to allyship, what are, what are things you've observed that are working well to improve lived experience through professional experience? I think either, biggest, either that you've observed or like things that people are working on and telling you they're trying to do. I think the lowest, lowest and highest denominator in this part of the conversation is be centering yourself. That is like my, my North Star in conversations with people in systems conversations with people when it comes to professional experience and lived experience is how much are you decentering yourself in a relationship with someone who has been faced with discrimination and in, in being put in a marginalized space and having to deal with systemic racism or oppression. And, you know, through my personal experience, I'll, I'll share one story about uh, a person decentering themselves um, where my palette group is actually a company that I bought from a gentleman, two gentlemen that co-founded it together in 2012. Mm -hmm. I joined their company in late 2012 in like April after that campaign with Hyundai and helped them build it, you know, from, I think it was like maybe 60K in revenue, like a quarter million dollars that first year. And I was doing new business and I was doing strategy while I was homeless living on a mattress in a warehouse. So that entire Hyundai campaign, my lived experience was on a mattress. I go to the gym every day to take a shower <laughs> every day. And then you'd go, to, <laughs> then you'd get flown around the country to participate in this campaign. Correct. So when they were like, Hey, we're going to send you to Brooklyn for this part of it. So if you're going to go to Chelsea market, you were like, yes, I get to sleep in a bed. <laughs> Can't wait. In a hotel, dude. <laughs> Holy moly. So, you know, and obviously no one knew that, like no one knows, like you're not even my business partners at the first company knew that I was like living in a warehouse and I hadn't paid my student loans and whatever. And they, they were like, Hey, do you want to work for free for the first six months? And I was like, sure. My life's already freelance. What's the difference? That was my way of thinking because I was like, if I'm going to make it to the next level, I need to find people who are at the next level and are thinking differently than me. So I need to learn from people. And so I just decided to join them on that journey. And it wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, glamorous at all. I still live in a warehouse. Yeah. After a couple of months, they're like, here's two grand a month. But here's here's what happened a couple of years later after I built the company, I built a team out to like six employees. I got us an office space. I got the co-working space that we were working out of to become a client. So like that was that was wild. So like here I am expanding the hell out of this company in so many different ways and um, growing as a leader, growing as an agency um, in Philadelphia. And then I just realized like I wasn't happy doing that anymore. And I went to uh, my partner at the time and I was like, I'm not happy. You know, I'm going to found this thing called Pallet Group. And I'm not going to lie, it's going to do the same exact thing. And I already got my first client lined up, my first annual contract. And we're just going to be doing social content alongside social strategy. Um, and that'll be our focus. And he said, you built this. You should own it. You should own it. It just, and I was he, like, he recognized. Yeah, he recognized that this isn't about me. This was, this was, I, I helped, I helped Nate build this thing. Yeah. And I played the role that I could up until this point. And now it is time for me to pass it along. And we set a deal up that made sense. And I was able to buy it over a couple months. And um, then I flipped the company to what you see today. That so was, what, uh, when that's, that's an incredible story. So when you say, um, decentralize yourself, decenter, decenter yourself to describe, 
Tell me more about what that means. That means, that means if you feel as a person that's non person of color or non black, that you by removing your emotions from a situation or physically removing yourself from a situation is going to help a person of color or a black person take the next step in their career or the next step in their life and you decenter yourself that is what we need to see happen period like that is the standard of what you know what needs to happen in allyship for 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 true change and equity be equity to be there because there's just so much more real estate that we don't have access to because seats are there yeah because people's our emotions are in the way right now and like you can't see past your lived experience and the emotions that you think are rationalizing your lived experience to see that someone else's is way more challenging yeah <laughs> you know and way more frustrating and way more full of pain and generational trauma and so if you decenter yourself and your emotions and your thoughts and your psyche and you really get present to what another person is going through, you, you realize very fast that the best way is to just step away and get out of the way and just allow someone else to step in. That It's about, it's about creating, creating space for someone else to take that opportunity. Mm-hmm. Do you still talk to those, those guys that, that you yeah. founded this yeah, with? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, every, every now and then we're still, we still communicate. Um, yeah, I'm friends. That's an incredible story. How has, um, so you had in October, you had kind of like you did with the, the freelance summit, you did an allyship and action summit. It was October, right? Yeah. State of equity. Yep. Yeah. Um, that was a huge event that you, that you conceived, put on, posted. Um, what was the reaction to that? What was the response like to that? So that was the third, that was the third allyship in action summit at that point. And, um, you know, all of them have this sort of humanizing, um, experience and grounding experience. And so it's, it's wild how electric most of them are too. Like people are on the chat going off. Um, so the response was, you know, all like, runs the gamut of like, I'm very mad at allyship in action for something that we did to all the way to, wow, like breathtaking out of the room. Like, I'm so happy I'm here to learn about this experience and learn how um, to be a white woman creating space for black women, or that if I am a Gen Zer, I can communicate with CMOs who have, you know, three, three decades of tenure on me in a way that I can hold them accountable to the allyship that they have in their lives and they have at their corporations. Um, and the, the conversation when I say like kind of mad at us is around the Tulsa police. We actually had, um, uh, Christina Pyle from Dentsu, the chief mm-hmm. diversity officer of Dentsu do a one-on-one with, uh, the Tulsa police department, um, a, uh, 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 officer from there. And it was, that could have went so bad. We could have had a cabs all through the chat, but everyone was present and like, really just like, yeah, what do police, what are they doing? Like, we want to abolish them, but in the meantime, what are y'all doing? You yeah. know, how is this really like, working? Yeah. How is this, how are y'all operating to be a bit, you know, to change, you know, to change. If this white dude is telling me he's changing, all right, we'll spell it out, you know, paint us the picture and let us yeah. allow us to like engage with you in a way where you can share more. And it was just wild because everyone was present and everyone was like, you know, whoa, but also, you know, we didn't have a counter to that. Like we should have had an abolitionist speak to like what it means to abolish I and what it means to defund the police. And so there was just a bit of one side in this, which is fair, like it's great feedback. And um, I think that's the beauty of what we built now. I ship in action is it doesn't belong to anyone. Yeah, It doesn't belong to anyone. And there are just, there's a community of people that we call the allyship army that produced that event. So it wasn't me, you know, it was a community of people. We had the art director, I art directed the first um, freelancer cyber summit, and then I passed it off to someone else to be the creative director. She passed it off to someone else to be the creative yeah. director for, you know, the, the state of equity. And we're passing it off again for the summits coming up this year. And like, there's this evolution of it where it doesn't belong to anyone. It's, it's, it's a atonement to a community who really want to fight for change, to be a part of the change um, in their industry, in their space. So how can we design systems around affecting change in our industry where anyone can have access to them because that's equity and that's what we're about. Yeah. And so you decentered yourself. 
you you exactly. got this you got it this far and you said okay i'm going to make space for the next person who has the passion from this vantage point to now take it to the next step and i hope that they do the same thing instead of them building a structure around it which the structure always end up creating processes to keep that group at the top that's incredible yeah. how has what you what you achieved with allyship in action played back into pallet group did you learn anything about community or just about the power, like the lesson you just explained about having the the perspective of Tulsa police and not having a counterpoint. Has any of that stuff played back into how you lead a power group? Great question. And I would say, yes. Um, I think it gives us confidence because we are, we see ourselves living between Germany and America. You know, mm-hmm. we talked about that earlier. Yeah. Um, and so you know, if anything, it really gives us confidence that we can design like pods of teams around projects um, that exist for a certain amount of time and disband. And like, that's just it. Like, there's a, we call them, we're calling them project pods. Um, and so we're designing little teams for allyship and action to work on things um, and they dissolve. And every summit last year was exactly that. It was like a little project pod of creatives in the industry who were like, I want to fight up against you know, equity in our space. Here's my value that I add. Here's my capacity. Let's get after it. And so we can design that same sort of modular approach to Pallet Group. And it sort of justifies the next step in our business model, which is designing a collective. So we're calling it the Pallet Grid, um, which is going to be a collective of creators that we're going to center, yeah. you know, on our website and um, through different experiences virtually where we'll show off the lived experience, the professional experience, cool. and the cultural nuance that shows up in the body of work of this first class of the pallet grid. And so we're going to invite all the people that we met through Allyship and Action to this experience awesome. to be a part of meeting our first class. Did you know, did you think about Allyship in Action that as a pilot for this or no? And you learned it after and you said, hey, I think we can apply X, Y, or Z to pallet group. Or what if we took this pod concept? Well, the power grid was something we've been working on for years, the power okay. grid specifically. Yeah. Um, so it was an idea that wanted to really do in 2019, but the timing wasn't right. Uh-huh. And I don't think we were positioned right in, in the market yet. It's so like allyship and action actually helped us garner a better position in the market. Like it, it was able to, to showcase how we are different and how we can add value to the market and how we can shape campaigns and design them and, you know, just our creative capacities and vision making on campaigns and so it's it's its own case study right to the point where clients are like can we get that for our industry and so um it's great and the pallet grid was just like an idea and then the project pods was like oh it's something that like came to me one day i'm like oh we'll just call these modular groups people project pods it sounds like interesting and um, <laughs> then the pallet grid and the project pod so it's sort of like they sort of complement each other in an interesting way, yeah. but, and it's just how we kind of organically um, operate anyway. And I think that's one of my, our privileges is like, we've sort of organically sort of been able to build the brand in, in a way that um, the brand of Palette Group specifically, in a way that it sort of has just been sculpting itself, Yeah, you know, over the years and like we're slowly maturing to become something that isn't quite anything else in the, in the industry. And, um, allows for itself to be um, its own um, standalone type of agency structure. That's really interesting. Um, I think it comes from your perspective on what community is and how community takes shape and evolves. I mean, I think it gives you the perspective, gives you the skill to see that and know when to shape it and when to back off it and let it do its thing is what I'm hearing. Yeah. And, you know, you're talking to a kid that was in the foster care system, right? So for me, I'm 32, but from zero to two, I was in foster care. So yeah. you know, my family, it was a bunch of immigrants in America who they got here and they're just like, I'm going to go do my thing. And like, really just had to go assimilate and figure it out. So I had to go back to the foster care house. So I never really had a home. I never really had like a grounded anchoring community yeah. because everyone was sort of everywhere you know, in and out of the foster house or in and out of the house of my families. And so I always have to design community and friendships um, on my own and like really figure out how to garner true bonds and relationships. So I think, you know, if I had a superpower, it'd probably be that is, is, is really truly having 
you know, genuine, real conversations with humans, um, even in a podcast. So, um, yeah, just through time, I think that has tempered my my, my skill set around community and, and connecting with humans. And um, I think that's like the real true art of business is, is just community building and being true to your values. Nate, you've, uh, you've given me, this is awesome. I'm glad we were able to talk. You've given me a ton of stuff to think about more, more things that I actually even have time to ask you questions about here. So I've, I'm, I'm going to be, well, no, don't apologize. You're crazy. Um, we're going to follow up. Uh, for the record, I also think you have a cool website. So don't, hold, don't, <laughs> don't hold that against me. <laughs> um, so Changing people can feelings. find that. People can find that at palettegrp.com. But uh, where else can people find you online and and uh, mm. and get in touch Instagram, with you? Instagram, Twitter, all of the things, LinkedIn, whatever you want to find me, you can. I'm going to post all those links, obviously, in the in the notes yes. and, and the post. Appreciate but that. thank you so much for uh, making time for me and uh, looking forward to seeing what you do with Palette Group and uh, how Palette Grid expands. Thanks so much. Appreciate it, dude. Thank you. Strategy Inside Everything is produced by me, Adam Kierno. If you liked what you heard, please leave a review wherever you listen to your podcast. It really helps. If someone shared this with you and you're just not sure where you could find it, you can go to specific.substack.com and sign up there and get episodes before everybody else. For more information about me, Adam Kierno, you can go to adampierno.com. There's information about my books, my speaking, and my strategy work. Have an idea for a guest? Send it my way. Just go to adampierno.com and you'll find a form there that will help you connect. Thanks for listening.